Hey everyone, Daniel Ramsey here, uh, my out desk, we're really excited, we've got Danny Griffin here, um, the realtyclassroom.com, he's a coach and we're just kind of running through some of your history, um, we also have Matt Johnson here from Viral, say hello guys, um, and then, hello, what, are hello. what are we talking about today, Danny, what are, what are we going to, what are we going to go over? Yeah, you you know, open up that can of worms that easily, huh? I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> like I told you, be careful. Pull the string on the back. I might not stop. Matt might have to shut it down. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, yeah, we're going to talk about what really is the um, the three core key strategic approaches to running a real estate business. And what I mean by that, Daniel, over the years as a good, in the terms of Michael Gerber's e-myth, I, I realize there's three people that uh, it really takes to become a successful small, small business person, let alone real estate agent business owner. And that's for everybody, not a broker. That's for every real estate agent. You're an independent contractor. You own a business. So the point is, what's your plan? And when everybody hears that, they go running for the hills, right? Nobody wants to sit down mm -hmm. and do what's called a business plan. Neither do I. I want to sell some houses. That's what I want to do. That's why I'm in the business. But you can't just do that and expect that it will ever turn into a business. So to help everybody, I've discovered that there are three core critical strategic plans that helped me run it as a better business and protect me from me. And hopefully everybody finds that to be the case. So we have three of them. Strategic okay, hold marketing. On. Oops. So you're going to give everybody uh, three plans. And, yes. and, and why should people – I mean like who – Danny, why are you qualified to give those plans? And like after getting those three plans, like tell us a little – give us a little background. I mean if you're yes. listening – if you're listening today, like – um, you know, most most of the folks that are on this are high level guys, right? So this yeah. shouldn't be new to them. So sure. what is the spin? What? Why are you going to deliver this different so they understand it and actually can implement it easily? Does that make great sense? Question. Yeah, great question. And, and look, first of all, let me say, I am you. If you're a real estate agent, top producer, or beginner, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll take any of them because I've been both. But just because we're top of the game, quote unquote, doesn't mean that we understand how a real estate agent business really works. And that's Michael Gerber's challenge. Just because you're a great technician and you know how to sell some houses doesn't necessarily mean you know how a real estate agent business works. And that haunts me because I should know better than, than this far down the road in my career to have gotten strategic. And the reason is, why am I qualified? Well, I have myriad experience in a variety of businesses, but not the least of which was early on in my career, Daniel, I spent some time in a Wall Street environment working with an analyst. And that required me to take several parts of the certified financial analyst exam, two out of three, until I left the business. And so I really spent a lot of time looking at income statements and balance sheets looking at the mechanics of the operations of how some of the best businesses work and really at the investment banking business, they were big businesses. They were hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, and they all had a very clear way that they did things. The best ones did. The most profitable ones did, right? Then for a year after that, trying to get into Harvard Business School, I changed courses and went to small business analysis in a venture capital company, and that's where I realized, uh-oh, I'm one of these folks. I'm an entrepreneur. But you now look at that end of the spectrum and you can see the difference between a really good startup and those were all of the folks who had a very clear strategic plan approach versus the guy. And, and this is a true story. We would actually go and do background checks on the people we were about to invest in to see their lifestyle. If they were living out of a garage and they were planning that and they were really working that, that was our person. If they were driving BMWs because all of a sudden they had a little cash flow, they were done instantly. So I think what's most important to take away from this is that that experience just simply opened up my eyes. So what qualifies me is nothing more than experience of doing all of that and then becoming another real estate agent just like everybody in this call. So there's the background. Good, good. Okay, so launch in. What are the three things that you have to have in a strategic sure. plan? Okay, let me first put them in, why I put them in this order. Um, when I went to retool this business for the Internet Age, first of all, I've also been trained by one of the best in the world. I mean, my mentor was Craig Proctor, who was the number one REMAX agent in the world several times, top 10 for 15 years. I got a unique experience with him to look inside, well, how does his business work? 
You don't right. just go out and sell 450 plus homes by yourself without killing yourself, right? It just doesn't happen. So when I looked in there, it wasn't just, oh, he has people, and we'll get into that and how we really came to know you. It's not just about adding people. That's just adding to the chaos. There was a structured way of doing things that to me, Daniel, looked just like an assembly line. So when I went to start this all over again for the internet age, I didn't throw that experience out. I said, okay, so there's how it works. I've seen it before, but it does need to be retooled for the internet age. So let's hire a consultant. So instead of going to hire a consultant, I said, well, let's just get somebody who's really good at that sort of a process. So I really started to look at Henry Ford. I just started to look at pictures of his assembly line when he started and what it is today. And if you do that and you Google that, you'll find a remarkable evolution from a very, uh, a very organized people system to something that now that includes a lot of software and engineering and tools. So the only difference is that progression of the tools available and the technologies. The people are still there, but their jobs have actually been elevated from pounding with a rubber mallet on the wheel to a machine tool that does that run by the human being who's now a software engineer. So keep that in context first that we are also an assembly line. And I understand, I said, look, if Henry would have come into this business and look at it for me, what would he say? He said, well, what's the order of things here? I know you're not manufacturing some hard product like a car, but you're still manufacturing the sale the way we do. So you have to go along there building that sale or what, the, what that thing is, and that thing is a service versus a car, but you can still do it the same way. So if you're going to bring in the raw materials like Henry Ford would, you have to start with some sort of a marketing plan. Everybody's in the marketing business, no matter what business they're in, says my mentor's mentor, Dan Kennedy. I agree with them. We have to find somewhere to get those raw materials. So the first plan is strategic marketing plan. How do you get them? But where this industry is severely broken, top producer, brand new agent, it doesn't matter, is the next plan. When you get those raw materials, also known as leads, and I don't care where you get them, you get them from sphere of influence or referrals to internet marketing, it doesn't matter. They Email just, database, it, right? It Matt? doesn't matter. It's, all, it's, it's right. all important. A strategy for how you add each one is what, what I'm talking about building there, but you need multiple sources of leads. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for failure when that one source really dries up on you. One is the worst number in a strategic marketing approach. But next, let's say, and again, you and I both know this to be true, and so does any top producer, leads, just names, contacts, are really a dime a dozen. You can buy them anywhere today. You can go onto the internet, put in real estate lead generation, and everybody wants your wallet. Everybody. And they will get you leads. Now, the quality of that lead is always debatable. But let's suffice to say, if you're good at sphere of influence, internet marketing leads, doesn't matter. They start to come in. Now what? I mean, do they all of a sudden just go down to the end of the assembly line and you monetize them? Well, of course not. And that's where the pandemic is. Meaning, there is no strategic follow-up to pursue every single lead. Now, hear what I'm saying. I believe in an approach that says, if I'm going to spend money for a lead, then I need a, an equal strategic follow-up plan to exhaust every one of them to find out the, the, a simple question. Are you going to buy or sell a house now, later, or never? That's all we want to know with everyone. We don't want to bother you but we don't want to forget you. It's sort of that where is the bed just right type of thing. So that strategic follow-up plan has to be built in an impeccable, clear way and not complicated. It's very simple. A strategy to say, I'm only going to put as much raw material onto this assembly line as it can handle so that I understand how it works. So if you have that strategic follow-up plan next, you have the first one-two punch that really becomes how you pull together a business versus a job. So those two things come together. And lastly, it, you can't really say that this is the only way to measure, but if those two things are happening 
and you come to a result, let's say it's a, a success or a failure. Let's say in, in Henry's wor world, a car comes off, it gets quality controlled, QC checked, one car is no good, you have to scrap it, three are great, right? And they get sold. So there's always something goes wrong, something goes right. That's where you measure. Well, well, the one that didn't make it to the showroom floor, what was wrong with that? Let's go back and measure how that all happened to yield that result and see if we can make an overall tweak in the other plans that yield this. And the ones that did go right, how did we do when they finally got out there? Did we turn a profit? And look, at it, in its basic form, strategic measurement planning, which is the last piece, is it blows me away that it's this simple. How many real estate agents don't realize that they need a professional bookkeeper and they need a professional accountant to help them measure the bare minimum A minus B equals C. Is this thing making money? I mean, I know you got your trophy for selling X number of homes and that sounded all great to the brokerage, but you're the one that owns the business, so did you strategically measure it at the end and figure out how good was it and could it be made better? So there you go. There's your, there's your three major foundational pieces that really are the tripod, that formation for that real that pyramid in a good sense, right? Those Egyptian pyramids, they're built like that and they're so strong because of it. You have to have them all. Okay, perfect. So I love what you're saying. I think most brokers they, they or agents out there, they miss two and three. Like the follow-up plan is non-existent and right. the measure plan is, is non-existent. So we'll jump into that. But let's yeah. just start like and, – and guys, if you're on here, uh, Matt's moderating. If you have a question, just pop it up. We're going to break those three down. We're going to get some advice from Danny, TV star, number seven in the world, <laughs> like uh, coach. You, you got 40 Stop, different coaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, flattery works, right? Um, so he's, we're, we're actually going to you – know, this is like a free coaching call from him, so I love it. So if I, I want to ask questions throughout those three different strategic follow-up or three different strategic plans and get sure. some advice from you for the people that are on our on our webinar right now. Sure. If I'm an agent and I'm, we're going to describe two different agents, I'm building a team that means 50 or less, or I've I've built a team and I'm successful, a hundred or more transactions. Those are the two people we're going to talk about. Sure. So if we're if I'm building a team 50 or less, you know. What should I be investing money in in terms of leads? Where should I be going? What right. should my team look like? How do you know? How do I get those leads in front of my follow up plan? So just give us some advice, and then speak to the top producing guy. What should they be doing that they're not doing right now? Well, well, here you know this is interesting because you put them in two different categories, and I'm going to tell you what I've learned along the way. Mm -hmm. I don't know a super uber top producer that didn't start from zero, right? I mean, me personally. When I, when I say that, let me go to my mentor, Proctor. He started grinding it out. Um, the guy was working That's another problem. Um, in the sanitation department. So there you go, right? Yeah. You, you know, we, we he was a janitor. You, you got it. That's a nice way to say it, right? He was a so, janitor. You know, he, he threw the garbage out the back door at the university, right? right. So, so that was his background, and we always talked about that because I think people want to explain it away. That's, that's another problem. I'm glad you just said that. Hey everyone, Daniel Ramsey here, uh, my out desk. We're really excited. We've got Danny Griffin here, um, the realtyclassroom.com. He's a coach, and we we're just kind of running through some of your history. Um, we also have Matt Johnson here from Viral. Say hello, guys. Um, and then hello, what hello. What are we talking about today, Danny? What are, what are we gonna What are we gonna go over? Yeah, you you know, open up that can of worms that easily, huh? I like that. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> like I told you, be careful, pull the string on the back. I might not stop. Matt might have to shut it down. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, we're gonna talk about what really is the um, the three core key strategic approaches to running a real estate business. And what I mean by that, Daniel, over the years as a good in the terms of Michael Gerber's e myth. I, I realize there's three people that uh, it really takes to become a successful small, small business person, let alone real estate agent business owner. And that's for everybody, not a broker. That's for every real estate agent. You're an independent contractor. You own a business. So the point is, what's your plan? And when everybody hears that, they go running for the hills, right? Nobody wants to sit down mm -hmm. and do what's called a business plan. Neither do I. 
I want to sell some houses. That's what I want to do. That's why I'm in the business. But you can't just do that and expect that it will ever turn into a business. So to help everybody, I've discovered that there are three core critical strategic plans that helped me run it as a better business and protect me from me. And hopefully everybody finds that to be the case. So we have three of them. Strategic okay, hold marketing. On. Oops. So you're going to give everybody uh, three plans, and yes. and and why should people? I mean, like who, Danny? Why are you qualified to give those plans? And like after getting those three plans, like tell us a little, give us a little background. I mean, if you're yes. listening, if you're listening today, like um, you know, most most of the folks that are on this are high level guys, right? So this yes. shouldn't be new to them. So sure. what is the spin? What? Why are you going to deliver this different? so they understand it and actually can implement it easily. Does that make great sense? Question. Yeah, great question. And, and look, first of all, let me say, I am you. If you're a real estate agent, top producer, or beginner, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll take any of them because I've been both. But just because we're top of the game, quote unquote, doesn't mean that we understand how a real estate agent business really works. And that's Michael Gerber's challenge. Just because you're a great technician, and you know how to sell some houses doesn't necessarily mean you know how a real estate agent business works and that haunts me because I should know better than than this far down the road in my career to have gotten strategic and the reason is why am I qualified well I have myriad experience in a variety of businesses but not the least of which was early on in my career Daniel I spent some time in a Wall Street environment working with an analyst and that required me to take several parts of the certified financial analyst exam, two out of three, until I left the business. And so I really spent a lot of time looking at income statements and balance sheets, looking at the mechanics of the operations of how some of the best businesses work. And really, at the investment banking business, they were big businesses. They were hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. And they all had a very clear way that they did things. The best ones did the most profitable ones did right then for a year after that trying to get into Harvard Business School I changed courses and went to small business analysis in a venture capital company and that's where I realized uh oh I'm one of these folks I'm an entrepreneur but you now look at that end of the spectrum and you can see the difference between a really good startup and those were all of the folks who had a very clear strategic plan approach versus the guy and, and this is a true story we would actually go and do background checks on the people we were about to invest in to see their lifestyle if they were living out of a garage and they were planning that and they were really working that that was our person if they were driving BMW's because all of a sudden they had a little cash flow they were done instantly so I think what's most important to take away from this is that that experience just simply opened up my eyes. So what qualifies me is nothing more than experience of doing all of that and then becoming another real estate agent just like everybody in this call. So there's the background. Good, good. Okay, so launch in. What are the three things that you have to have in a strategic sure. plan? Okay, let me first put them in, why I put them in this order. Um, when I went to retool this business for the Internet Age, first of all, I've also been trained by one of the best in the world. I mean, my mentor was Craig Proctor, who was the number one Remax agent in the world several times, top 10 for 15 years. I got a unique experience with him to look inside, well, how does his business work? You don't right. just go out and sell 450 plus homes by yourself without killing yourself, right? It just doesn't happen. So when I looked in there, it wasn't just, oh, he has people, and we'll get into that and how we really came to know you. It's not just about adding people. That's just adding to the chaos. There was a structured way of doing things that, to me, Daniel, looked just like an assembly line. So when I went to start this all over again for the Internet age, I didn't throw that experience out. I said, okay, so there's how it works. I've seen it before, but it does need to be retooled for the Internet age. So let's hire a consultant. So instead of going to hire a consultant, I said, well, let's just get somebody who's really good at that sort of a process. So I really started to look at Henry Ford. I just started to look at pictures of his assembly line when he started and what it is today. And if you do that and you Google that, you'll find a remarkable evolution from a very 
uh, a very organized people system to something that now that includes a lot of software and engineering and tools. So the only difference is that progression of the tools available and the technologies. The people are still there, but their jobs have actually been elevated from pounding with a rubber mallet on the wheel to a machine tool that does that run by the human being who's now a software engineer. So keep that in context first that we are also an assembly line. And I understand, I said, look, if Henry would have come into this business and look at it for me, what would he say? he said, say, well, what's the order of things here? I know you're not manufacturing some hard product like a car, but you're still manufacturing the sale the way we do. So you have to go along there building that sale or what, the, what that thing is, and that thing is a service versus a car, but you can still do it the same way. So if you're going to bring in the raw materials like Henry Ford would, you have to start with some sort of a marketing plan. Everybody's in the marketing business, no matter what business they're in, says my mentor's mentor, Dan Kennedy. I agree with them. We have to find somewhere to get those raw materials. So the first plan is strategic marketing plan. How do you get them? But where this industry is severely broken, top producer, brand new agent, it doesn't matter, is the next plan. When you get those raw materials, also known as leads, and I don't care where you get them. You get them from sphere of influence or referrals, to internet marketing, it doesn't matter. They Email just, database, it, right? It Matt? doesn't matter. It's, all, it's, it's right. all important. A strategy for how you add each one is what, what I'm talking about building there, but you need multiple sources of leads, otherwise you're setting yourself up for failure when that one source really dries up on you. One is the worst number in a strategic marketing approach. But next, let's say, and again, you and I both know this to be true, and so does any top producer, leads, just names, contacts, are really a dime a dozen. You can buy them anywhere today. You can go onto the internet, put in real estate lead generation, and everybody wants your wallet. Everybody. And they will get you leads. Now, the quality of that lead is always debatable. But let's suffice to say, if you're good at sphere of influence, internet marketing leads, doesn't matter. They start to come in. Now what? I mean, do they all of a sudden just go down to the end of the assembly line and you monetize them? Well, of course not. And that's where the pandemic is. Meaning, there is no strategic follow-up to pursue every single lead. Now, hear what I'm saying. I believe in an approach that says, if I'm going to spend money for a lead, then I need a, an equal strategic follow-up plan to exhaust every one of them to find out the, the, a simple question. Are you going to buy or sell a house now, later, or never? That's all we want to know with everyone. We don't want to bother you but we don't want to forget you. It's sort of that where is the bed just right type of thing. So that strategic follow-up plan has to be built in an impeccable, clear way and not complicated. It's very simple. A strategy to say, I'm only going to put as much raw material onto this assembly line as it can handle so that I understand how it works. So if you have that strategic follow-up plan next, you have the first one-two punch that really becomes how you pull together a business versus a job. So those two things come together. And lastly, it, you can't really say that this is the only way to measure, but if those two things are happening and you come to a result, let's say it's a, a success or a failure. Let's say in, in Henry's wor world, a car comes off, it gets quality controlled, QC checked, one car is no good, you have to scrap it, three are great, right? And they get sold. So there's always something goes wrong, something goes right. That's where you measure. Well, well, the one that didn't make it to the showroom floor, what was wrong with that? Let's go back and measure how that all happened to yield that result and see if we can make an overall tweak in the other plans that yield this. And the ones that did go right, how did we do when they finally got out there? Did we turn a profit? And look, at in its basic form, strategic measurement planning, which is the last piece, is it blows me away that it's this simple. How many real estate agents don't realize that they need a professional bookkeeper and they need a professional accountant to help them measure the bare minimum A minus B equals C? Is this thing making money? 
I mean, I know you got your trophy for selling X number of homes, and that sounded all great to the brokerage, but you're the one that owns the business, so did you strategically measure it at the end and figure out how good was it and could it be made better? So there you go. There's your, there's your three major foundational pieces that really are the tripod, that formation for that real that pyramid in a good sense, right? Those Egyptian pyramids, they're built like that, and they're so strong because of it. You have to have them all. Okay, perfect. So I love what you're saying. I think most brokers they, they or agents out there, they miss two and three. Like the follow-up plan is non-existent and right. the measure plan is, is non-existent. So we'll jump into that. But let's yeah. just start like and, – and guys, if you're on here, uh, Matt's moderating. If you have a question, just pop it up. We're going to break those three down. We're going to get some advice from Danny, TV star, number seven in the world, <laughs> like uh, coach. You you got forty Stop, different coaching. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flattery works, right? Um, so he's we're we're actually going to. You know, this is like a free coaching call from him. So I love it. So if I, I want to ask questions throughout those three different strategic follow-up or three different strategic plans and get sure. some advice from you for the people that are on our on our webinar right now. Sure. If I'm an agent and I'm, we're going to describe two different agents, I'm building a team that means 50 or less, or I've I've built a team and I'm successful 100 or more transactions. Those are the two people we're going to talk about. Sure. So if we're if I'm building a team 50 or less, you know. What should I be investing money in in terms of leads? Where should I be going? What right. should my team look like? How do you know? How do I get those leads in front of my follow up plan? So just give us some advice, and then speak to the top producing guy. What should they be doing that they're not doing right now? Well, well, here you know this is interesting because you put them in two different categories, and I'm going to tell you what I've learned along the way. Mm -hmm. I don't know a super uber top producer that didn't start from zero, right? I mean, me personally. When I, when I say that, let me go to my mentor, Proctor. He started grinding it out. Um, the guy was working for the local university um, in the sanitation department. So there you go, right? Yeah. You, you, you know, we, we he was a janitor. You, you got it. That's a nice way to say it, right? He was a so, janitor. You know, he, he threw the garbage out the back door at the university, right? right. So, so that was his background, and we always talked about that because I think people want to explain it away that somehow top producers are different from anybody else. Um, they may be a little bit more tenacious in their pursuit of what they want, also known as success. Okay, fine. We can get into the head stuff another day. But, but the point is, he took it from zero and scaled it. So what I believe, and I teach this, I mean, I have somebody who started from zero, another guy, two guys in my coaching group that are starting from zero. One guy left a builder where he was really sort of stuck there and, and you know, was coming out to zero. And I said, look, here's your strategy. You obviously have a limited budget in this situation. He's down in Dallas too, by the way, so we can make a reference to the marketplace. So Alan was down in Dallas and, and he comes out and I said, look, you need to combine those two first two strategies. Now, I expect you to get a stack of business cards, okay, that simply have your IDX website on it that's branded, right? Um, uh, XHomeSearch.com. In other words, GriffinHomeSearch.com. Right. And, and here's what I think I can get you into this business on a shoestring. I think if you can give me about a $250 ad spend a month on Google Pay Per Click, and you can spend about $99 a month to buy market leader software for IDX, you're up and going with at least internet leads. Those business cards, I expect to say that URL, and if people sneeze the word real estate anywhere near you, you stick that business card in their hand and you hustle. So at bare minimum, you have this human contact, which by the way, everybody underestimates. I don't, I don't think I've ever gone out socially and not found some discussion about real estate. Um, food, air, water. Um, hey, where are you from? Oh, you live over there? It's so easy to get into that conversation and then say, gee, if you ever know of anybody or you need some help, here's my website, this instant access to homes. Have some fun. Right, yeah. so that's literally what he started to do. And again, he's not—he's not a kid that doesn't have any contacts. So he was able to pass those cards out and tell people. But very quickly, through the Google pay-per-click in a very simple ad, instant access to homes for sale. Period. Okay, this is working in my world right now. Nobody is stopped from going to Google and writing a classified ad and thinking, "Geez, I wonder what my." avatar or ideal client would type in to see that ad. 
And with mm -hmm. some small relative budget, you can take them there, drive them to a community page in Market Leader that delivers pictures, which is what they want, of those houses. Instantly, they start to look. Instantly, there's a lead capture. Anybody can do that today. That's like yeah. a, 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 I don't know, a 30-minute setup. If you call, and Market Leader's not the only one. I happen to, that was the one I chose, Daniel, when I was starting to really look into IDX and how it coordinated with Google. There's done for you solutions out there too by these companies, but that's a do it yourself type of solution that is so simple. So he right. did that and he got up and going. Now, let's flash forward to Ottawa, Canada. You can go Google his name, Paul Rushforth. I started coaching Paul when I was at Proctor in 2008, I think, and Paul was one of these guys that came out of um, pro hockey. Uh, he was in the minor leagues in pro hockey, made some money, so he could come right out, and he was a tough guy in hockey. You should see him. He's a big guy. So um, he gets up on stage one day, and I'm doing this power makeover of business, and he says, well, I do 125 deals, and the crowd, ooh, 125 deals, I want to be that. So I listen a little bit more and I look at him and you have to see us standing next to each other, right? I mean, I'm five, nine and a half in my high heeled sneakers, right? And this guy's about <laughs> six foot four, right? So, so I, he's a teddy bear though, right? Oh teddy yeah, bear. yeah. I don't think so, right? So I said, hey, hey, Paul, two things are going to happen here, one or the other, right? You're either going to superstardom, and he was at KW by the way, Keller Williams. So I said, you're going to superstardom or your business is going to implode. And the crowd just like kind of went, I think it was 200 people in the room, the crowd just went silent. And I said, here's why. It's easy to spend your way with those billboards that you're running, with all those wrapped cars that you're running, and these good salespeople and a good admin. So his little core team was really three people. He, he himself was the prime seller and entrepreneur. He had Dominique, who was a great salesperson, and he had Jocelyn, who was a world-class administrator. So that was the core of their business. I think they have a couple peripheral people doing 125 deals. So don't be delusional to think that it takes a lot of people. It just takes people doing a lot of the right things. And they were. But they had a very tenuous situation because you can get caught up in spending, spending, spending. And that's where strategic marketing came to play for them. But also, he was just giving these leads that he was spending on over to the agents. Now, I know you have a lot of people that are probably listening to this that might cringe when I say this, but I wouldn't be in a hurry to do that because agents, outside sales agents, will always take a little bit of action until they get out in the field with clients and they'll stop following up on the money you're spending. And that's where strategic follow-up becomes very important. That's exactly why I came to you at my out desk to get your people involved in that spot there as an inside sales agent. So now, pro let me just flash forward. Proctor and Rushforth went from small like Allen, and all they did was scale it. So it went from 125 deals. I think Jocelyn told me they did 600 and something deals last year in Ottawa, Canada. Now remember, Canada's a hot market. Ottawa's the hottest spot is the capital city. So I don't think you're going to go do it where you're selling nothing but REO still, and, and it's a grind. This is a good economy. They're pulling oil out of the tar sands in Canada. Canada in general says, recession, what? Right? They don't even understand it. So don't be deluded to think that all markets are equal before I start to tell you numbers. So I can explain some of it that way. But what I'll really tell you, Daniel, I went up there. They flew me up in 2009 and I said, look, stop giving all your leads to outside sales agents. Build a world-class inside sales effort. Jocelyn, you're going to be in charge of managing the ISAs um, and you're going to build it. They went from no ISAs and as we sit here today, the, the 600 deals last year, there's five ISAs and only 13 outside sales agents. Right. I want that to linger there for a second because I want people to understand that's the way they got there. It wasn't 50 people. So it's a very you know, profitable business with not a lot of people to the number of deals that they do. So you know, hopefully that helps you see that it's all about that scale in there and that strategic follow-up that manages those inside sales agents is everything. Well, okay, so you said something and I want to kind of point in here and then we'll check with, check with yeah. you, Matt, for questions. But um, so I've always followed this thing. When you're an entrepreneur, which you and I were both were, were those folks, sure. um, it's an I do it. Like I sell, I sold 50 houses. I sold 75 houses. Yeah, I have an admin. Yeah, I have a, a showing assistant or a buyer's agent or a listing person. But I did it. 
Sure. But there's some, something happens at at a hundred where it has to become we are doing it. Yeah. And that we is a shift that if you're not prepared for it as a business person can be really rocky. Sure. And that's when you have to have all these follow up plans and a strategic plan and all these plans in place because the we becomes a lot harder to to, to kind of jump from a hundred to two hundred and then something happens when you pass two two to three, somewhere in there. Yes. Yeah. They have to do it. Yeah, well, and, and that's and that's a dream business come true, right? It, it, is if you get to that point. I remember sitting with Gary Keller. I had the fortune of sitting with him uh, at two Craig Proctor conferences, where he was the the featured speaker back in a little green room where there was only five of us, and I really picked his brain. And mm -hmm. I could see that Gary um, was well, obviously now at this point, well out on that curve and a great person to listen to um, who had gone from that agent sitting there doing his affirmations down in Austin, Texas, getting himself fired up every day, going out and selling a lot of homes, to realizing that he was losing his agents because he was on 50-50 split with them to Remax who was basically just saying, hey, we'll charge you less. So yeah. he needed to come up with some way to bridge that gap. Well, the rest is history on that and I'll leave it to that. But what I saw in Gary when we spoke was how he had really minimized his involvement over time. And that's the ultimate. I understand that. Where he's basically just focused on writing his books, having mm -hmm. fun doing, you know, the masterminding stuff or speaking that he does. And it really is sort of a turn to the table and said, how many agents do we have? I mean, really, that's what he said. How many yeah. agents do we have? Because I think the systems and the formulas uh, were in there well enough at that point where you could plug more and more and more people into it. And there's the point. I mean, Keller Williams is one of the best examples of a company that has fought for a place for systems in their discussion. I mean, I'm not a KW agent, so I'm not going to speak for it internally. Some people love it, some don't. I understand that. Go to any other place that has systems in place that benefit you. But that's how you get there. That's how Gary got there. That's how anybody gets there. So I'll right. go back for a second. And I know we're talking to top producers here, but I will warn them because I am one. I will say this, is that the I do thing is fine and it's profitable and I have no problem with it. There's nothing better than the hustle. You make more money than everybody else if you do it. There's no doubt. That's a margin thing. No rocket science there. You sell it with nobody else involved. You start off by paying your bills with what I refer to as, of course, after your brokerage split, if you're at a brokerage, 100 cent dollars. Yeah. As soon as you start to give it away to buyer agents and you have a 50-50 split, for, uh, for example, now you're paying all your bills with 50 cent dollars and then you have to turn a profit. So clearly, you have to replace your dollars with a much bigger volume and you will never replace you one for one or one for two in that case. So in other words, if you sell 10, you're not just going to find two people going to sell 20 and the math all works nice and cozy like that, right? Doesn't work like well, that. Why? 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 Because they will never be you. Why? Right? Because if you are an entrepreneurial top producer, you are a unique cat in this world. Man or woman, I don't care. You have a unique wiring. That's who you are. And so to think that you're going to go out just because, for example, I'm a high D, I guy, I'm going to go get high I, D and, uh, gals and guys and they're going to do what I do. Yeah, but what if they have that missing letter in the DISC personality profile, the E for entrepreneur? You know what they want to know from you? How are you going to make me more money than that guy down the street? Because, yeah, you can monkey around with all this internet marketing stuff and all that stuff you talk about, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. I just want to make money. And if you can't provide me the best solution, I'm going down the street to this guy. So they think differently than an entrepreneurial agent. And that's who you're going to hire, I think, in an optimal form. Because if you hire another entrepreneurial agent, guess what you have? Mega conflict, and they're going to leave anyway because they're yeah. going to want to do it themselves. You're going to so, teach your competition, <laughs> basically, how to run your business. Okay, so hold that thought. Because if that's your fear, now you don't grow beyond your fear. You say, mm -hmm. well... These guys have a good topic today, but why would I ever do that? I'm just going to keep selling. I don't care. So what? If they bury me in my real estate clothing at the end of life, I made a ton of money. I went to Aruba. I did this. Okay, great. There's no argument to that. But what if there's a better way? Like this is my magnificent obsession in this industry. What if there is a way where you could sell more and more and more yourself, your agents could sell more and more themselves, and everybody starts to get happier as time goes on? 
I'll make an argument that Keller has approached that kind of a culture. Not yeah. everybody at that company, but his top producers and he have sort of gone that way. So why not pursue that? Why just accept what's okay, that it's okay to kill yourself and work your tail off um, and not pursue a better way if you're an entrepreneur? And so I think therein lies that whole thing about, okay, how? I'm telling you how. A checklisted system from marketing to follow up to measurement tells you more and more and more about how your business really works so you can stop doing the things that are exhausting you and mm -hmm. start doing more of the things that actually affect a positive outcome. And, and Daniel, I have to tell you, I've been around business a long time. Uh, like Gary Vaynerchuk, my family was in the wine and spirits business. I wish I was as smart as Gary or maybe as young as Gary when the internet really was there to sell wine. I did yeah. it the hard way. I took a store from 700000 to 2.8, just hustling business cards and doing what I could. Um, but I get it. So I've had small business all my life, big business with the um, investment banking, and then back into startups with, with um, the, you know, the venture capital business. I'm telling you, man. It's all about checklisted strategies. That's all this is. So even if somebody's doing something right and they don't want to do it the way I do it or you do it or anybody, good. Just make a list of what's working and start to scr scratch out the things that didn't really work. Remember my analogy about strategic measurement? Yeah. Study the failed one as much as the successful one. All yeah. of these deals are coming from Google pay-per-click through market leader. Isn't that great? Let's do more. Yeah, but what happened to that guy? Wasn't he also that failed one from Google? So it's not just Google that's successful. What happened to him? Well, it turns out that that guy wasn't really motivated. And you took him all the way down the line and you didn't ask him, hey, did you have a bankruptcy last year? And it turns out he did. So what could you have done better in follow-up? You see what I'm saying? It's that analysis and that hunger. And look at Gerber calls it a game worth playing. Make your business a game worth playing, right? Figure it mm -hmm. out. Be inquisitive. Try to figure out how it works. And boy, you can have a lot better life than you think you can and still sell more in less time. You want to know how I know that? I filmed a TV show from Wednesday morning all the way through Sunday night. When I tell you we did not stop, we did the show for A&E, 60 seconds to sell. It was a short-lived deal, seven episodes. I worked from December to June, Wednesday through Friday, I sold 29 properties last year, I coached 40 people, and I worked on this, and I didn't get divorced, and my kids didn't disown me. So don't tell me you can't get more out of the 168 hours that you have every week. So am I coming through, am I coming through the camera too much, Matt? You know, is the coffee or the enthusiasm? I mean, what is it? <laughs> no, you've, had a, you've had some coffee this morning. That's all right. It's good stuff, though. <laughs> all right. Do we, do we have any uh, questions or any comments? Crouton marketing, meaning what? The message on the ad in Facebook or, or Google should be almost reiterated on the landing page so the language stays consistently. It's the same breadcrumb the consumer is trying to follow so that you get them to take action. As soon as they get confused or it's too slow, you lost them. So I just want to make sure that keep it simple. Nothing sophisticated here. It is if you've never delved into it before, but it's actually easy how it works logically, I guess. Mm -hmm. And hey guys, we got a couple of uh, of really good questions that came in that cool. that are on this specific point. So I wanted to give you a chance to address them before we move on. Sure. So number one, uh, dealing with Facebook, Jennifer has a question about: Do you actually pay for likes? Do you get into any of that, or is the specific ads to drive to a landing page? Yeah, let me say this: the 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 algorithms and the the policies with Google and Facebook change so frequently. I don't think you could ever get to the point where you set it and forget it. It sounds sexy and it sounds good. I don't recommend it because I think this is the wild west of marketing. And those two companies, amongst others, are trying to figure out how does this really work. So all the people that heavily invested in spending money to get likes to their page were under the assumption that with all those likes there would be organic search to those people. So in other words, I just spent all this money and I have 100,000 likes on my page. So I put this piece of content up there that leads to a landing page and guess what? Nobody sees it because Facebook changed the game. They said, well, you know, now that we've got this all figured out, that's fine, but you have to pay to push your content to the people you paid to like it. So that was just an unfortunate evolution. Well, what and I even I even yeah, have a ahead. little something different. I mean, 
I, I remember Google used to give you juice if your name was in the website. Now they don't. Right. Like if, if you're a you know Sacramento real estate, which is my hometown, you got juice back in the day. So everybody wanted Sacramento real estate or the neighborhood yeah. that you were living in, EastSacramento.com or whatever. Now, guess what? Flash flash forward four or five years, Google gives you zero juice for that yeah. thing. So my advice to the Jennifer is focus on making your landing page the ad most applicable to the thing that you're trying to do and like Danny said keep them consistent but just put out a really good product and focus on great follow up in the because that's what people are doing they they want they're registering they're trying to get information you know as long as you come to them and you're and you're doing a great job they're going to like you um, yeah, let me and, yeah, I was just to say, watch, this is cool, too. What, uh, who asked the question? Was it Jennifer, did you say? That was the one for the likes on Facebook, yeah. Okay. We've got another question on follow-up I'd like you guys to get to, too. Sure. Hang on for one second. I just want to help Jennifer. One more, one more moment here. I think one of the coolest things for real estate agencies that I'm starting to dabble in a little bit more in test, I think you're, you're trying to set your page up as much as a community page and you know sort of that, that, that lifestyle. People love pictures and that's what Facebook is all about. It's about pictures. I mean look at when you run an ad on Facebook and your verbiage is more than 20% of the picture, they'll shut it down. So what's that tell you? They understand their medium. Play the game they want to. So I think, and I've been doing this a couple of times recently, take a beautiful picture of Cape Cod. I post it to that page, and then what I do is I boost it. I boost the page, I mean the post, for peanuts. I can go, I can go a buck a day, one dollar a day for five days in a row to boost it. Just a beautiful picture of a pond in Cape Cod inside my market area, and people see it. And Jennifer, all of a sudden, they start to hit the like button. They share it. You know, it's, it's that experience. And then somewhere along the line after you've done all that lifestyle stuff and you want to drop in a post about your free over the net home evaluation or you want to put in one of your testimonials, that's where I think the money is by the way. You get a happy picture of your happy clients with a testimonial and mixed in with these pictures and community information and you boost the post, that goes a long way to spreading your brand. Mix it yeah, in. And you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, for anybody that's interested, his Gary Vaynerchuk's book, The Jab, 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 Right Hook, mm -hmm. has an entire chapter in there about Facebook, where he goes into exactly how to build your ad, how to get ads that you know just your posts out there. Watch the ones that perform really well, and then jump on those and boost them. And he even goes and has the screenshot examples of what great boosted posts on Facebook look like. It's a for, within the book. It's a fairly small chapter. You can easily get through it in a couple of days and get everything you'll ever need to know to tinker around on Facebook. Yeah. And by the way, Matt, to to, to translate the jab 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 right hook, right? It's give 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 ask. And that's exactly yep. what I just explained. By the way, the first time I ever heard it was Ryan Dice's partner, Barry, uh, Perry Belcher, um, who was always talking about it. He, he was one of the first guys back in 08, I think I was watching, that got to 100,000 Twitter followers. And he was just putting out just stuff, stuff, stuff. And then it would be um, you know, a bitly linked to something they were selling. But you were so engrossed in all of this other stuff that it was natural to say, yeah, let me check out what he has because he's been such a sharer. So share, 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 ask. Man, I'll tell you, that just works. And by the way, boost, 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 boost. And you know that I was going to add, we have a client in Texas who actually built a huge um, like following on Facebook just by, by um, posting all the community events that's inside right. of his pace, Facebook page, yeah. so every event that was going on in the city, and and so people just and and you know how the news, the newspaper and websites, they're all bad at they, they only do some shows and not every show. So they actually used one of our, our virtual assistants to pull every single event in the entire city onto one Facebook. They put they got to their limit in terms of a community page. They put everybody in their farm in that, and 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 then it was the ask, ask, ask. Or jab, it. jab, jab, ask. What you know what I'm talking about? What was the other? What was the other question? What was the other question? So the other question was about is getting into the follow up, which we need to get into because we're running out of time. So um, David Drennan had a question about the non branded like buyer leads that you get. How David do you Drennan, have any my man, specific David follow? David Drennan, the David Drennan. I know David Drennan, my man. <laughs> yeah. So so do how do I feel about the less branded stuff? 
yeah, specific follow-up for buyers that are non-branded once you get the lead online. Yeah, so okay, that's a great question. David comes out of a school that I come out of where it was, hey, when can we get together for 15 or 20 minutes so I can take down your exact criteria? Now, if you're Canadian and IDX hasn't permeated the consumer's mindset, you can still get away with that a lot of the time. What I found in my experience in my market, because Realtor.com is a 1996 phenomenon, that it has well permeated the behavior patterns of the American consumer where I am. And so now they're just saying, get together for what? I'm, I'm getting it on my cell phone. What do I need you for? So our script or our follow-up, if we can get them, by the way, I'm not going to get into the total details of follow-up, but we have two layers of autoresponders. So in other words, somebody comes into our world, they're getting the IDX feed of the houses, they're getting a string of emails that are educational, that are positioning us as the educator, expert, and they're getting conversational emails where we're trying to provoke them into a conversation because most of them are hiding behind their email. Are you getting the right properties? Have you seen anything you like? So there's three layers that are all automatic before we get there. But let's suffice to say that we get into a phone conversation with somebody at some point. Hey David, it's Danny Griffin calling for the Griffin Realty Group and the reason we're calling is we just want to thank you for choosing to use our website to search for homes. Are you getting everything that you wanted? I mean that's simple. Just we are here as a concierge, okay? We just want to let you know and again that was my little edit there to just say the attitude when you're getting there is that hey you took our gift, we offered it online, you came to our website and you're getting those free homes from us. You see the difference between us and a Zillow, a Redfin or any of these other companies is we're real human beings behind this and we're here as the real estate agent to answer any other questions. So if there's anything that you see that you want more detail, even if you want us to preview a house, no problem, we're here for you. By the way, while I have you, were you thinking about doing something now or later? Or never? Either one of those outcomes, any of them, okay, is a good result. Now, having said that, because you set it up by letting them know you're the gift giver, offering concierge service, the gift that they typically give us back is some honesty about their timing. And that's all we want. So we're not going to push for a meeting on somebody that says, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to retire to Cape Cod in the next couple of years. Really? Yeah, where do you work? Oh, I work up at Honeywell in Boston, and I'm, I'm down to two years. Well, we're not going to sit there and say, well, gee, let's get together for 15 or 20 minutes. It's just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So we're trying to match our conversation and our future follow-up to their true timing. We're listening, and we're saying, great. What we'll do is we'll continue to send these properties to you and we'll follow up on a periodic basis. Would that be okay with you? Well, the answer is rhetorical, right? Or the question is rhetorical. The answer is automatic. No problem as long as they're legitimate. Now, a lot of them on a less branded marketing, what, what does that mean, by the way? If you're not familiar with it, it means that the ad would be more generic about you know free instant access to homes for sale but maybe the the marketing that references the real estate agency is diminutized it's made smaller it's still legally compliant but it, it's more about the offer of what they get not who's giving it um, I've definitely shifted away from that I don't have any less branded marketing um, except one one system that's done for me by the way uh, and even there I kinda tweaked it to be branded so hopefully that helps it's concierge attitude we're gonna do what Gary and Be uh, and all these people we were talking about before Perry Belcher a long time ago we're gonna give 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 we've raised the free what we give away for free way up from where it used to be we're gonna give you everything and anything just to get the opportunity to meet with you. So, my man well, David. I would, I would even like to answer David. I would say every single uh, lead generated, the only segmentation that I would do is buyer versus seller, and then I'd put them in the, into the same. You're just trying to test what their actual interest is and like when they're going to move, like Danny was going to say. So, non branded, those people are, are getting a call in the exact same way as a branded one. Totally. And, and and I don't mind the non-branded if you if you're just spending money, but um, just spending money to get te to get more leads for the agents that work in your house in your office. Um, but even that, I would be I would be interested in like measuring it and making sure it's actually 100% worth it. I was talking to somebody else, mm. and it's interesting. And and we are almost out of time, so we're gonna close quickly. But I was talking to somebody else, and they're building this massive. Um, buyer agent focus and this massive 
um, like uh, spend, spend on buyer leads. And I think you need, as a real estate agent, you need to have a buyer team and you need to have a, a focus there. But I'm a big fan of focusing on listings. Um, being a broker, I sold hundreds of homes in, in a single year, so I actually know the scale piece. Right, right. Um, I always went after sellers because guess what? I always got paid two or three times on a seller. Mm -hmm. And because... And and the buyers, it's a one shot deal, man. And so if I'm if you if you got a non branded website, and this kind of goes back to David world, this is more of my world, I would want to start looking at measuring that and verifying that there's actual value there and then maybe even redirecting some funds into the seller side of generating listing leads and listing appointments, because that's what, what I want. Yeah. Let me just say this real quick. Okay. I have gotten four new clients in the past thirty days. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them had a done-for-you website that was generating leads for them. Okay, let me just give you some of the math to fright you and and have you understand, Daniel, even more so why I kick them over to my out desk to get somebody for inside sales as managed by this application that I've built. Um, I had somebody the other day and said, "How many leads do you have there?" You know, they did all sphere of influence. Some folks in Colorado, super nice, and they're they're cash squeezed right now. Thirty deals last year. Okay, all sphere of influence and all referral, but yet they come out of an internet lead generation background. I said, mm -hmm. well, in that platform, how many leads do you have? And they told me 450. I said, now take the average sale, sale price in your marketplace. Well, Daniel, it accounted for, ready, $252 million of unrealized sales potential. Now again, if you follow the formula that it, we found true, more than 50% of that goes out the door, but that still leaves 125 million of potential. Round it down, throw another cool 25 million in sales out the door. I have 100 million to follow up with. If I did 7% of that, 3.5% of it, you pick the number, am I not much better off? So if it's about quantity, you're just getting buried in unrealized potential if you're not filtering through them. So I don't care what kind they are. If you don't build the filtering system, you're just burying yourself. Okay, so real quick, let's run through the measurement because I have a couple things I want to hear um, from you on that. I know this is important, sure. if, and, and then we'll finish up. How should a real estate person measure? Since we're at the, you know, we're in January, you should take the last 12 months and do what with it? Okay, um, you should always certainly have an end of year income statement. Okay, first of all, I highly recommend to all of you get a professional bookkeeping company. I don't care how small or big your business is, it is the most important money you'll spend. Get a professional certified public accountant to give you tax strategy or Canada Revenue or the you know the, the tax man here, Uncle Sam, will show up on your doorstep. That's your partner you're not getting away from. You need professional help. When you get that help, you'll have an income statement, okay? That is just simply A minus B equals C. You account for everything. When you don't own the brokerage, you still account for that. That was Paul Rushforth's biggest financial measurement lesson. He was taking off the top what he paid to Keller Williams. Well, wait a minute. That's a cost of a sale. And manufacturing, that's what they call it. It's a cost of a sale. You have to account for that. It affects your gross margin. So a yearly income statement would be the bare minimum with those two professionals. You should be doing that every month. Now that's just your financial system basics. But before we run out of time, what I would say, the better your strategy for marketing, and especially with some of these internet sources, and the better the follow-up, the easier it is to begin to build measurement systems for the effectiveness along the assembly line before it ever gets to a monthly result. So I'm saying yes, let's at least make this a smarter business by looking at monthly, quarterly, and yearly income statements. But where you really need to be looking is, as well, how is the money that you're spending doing? Are you getting the type of leads the quality of leads, what's happening there. And Daniel, when they come to you, they need to also measure that people cost. If they set that all up correctly, man, it's a no-brainer to come to you to make that monetizable and measurable. No one should ever be able to hire somebody from you and not be able to measure it because if they do that, brother, your business will expand tenfold. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, 
do we have any other questions, Matt, before we wrap it up? No, nothing that I've seen. Okay, perfect. So what I'd like to do, Danny, I, what do you, what can you give the folks that have been listening and like walking through this with us? What can you give away? Um, a, something of value that would sure. like open their eyes and help them in their business. Yeah, definitely. We've um, been and we're under construction too. So I'll tell you, anybody that gets on this list will also get over the next sixty days an upgraded module of this. But there's a free mini course at the realtyclassroom.com. If you go to the main page. Just put your name on that list. You'll get the email course that I built. And again, because you'll be tagged for that list, I promise you it's only going to get better from there because I'm going to raise the free bar there too, give you some free video, and you'll be on a nice little list there with us too. Nothing to sell you, just to help you. The realtyclassroom.com. Go right to the homepage. Danny Griffin, thanks for coming with us. Matt Johnson from Viral, thanks for moderating. Guys, I really appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you both. Matt, you saved us technology-wise, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, guys. Thanks so much. Okay, buddy.